So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> we're going to just jump in. We're going to be talking about how God provides for the church and for uh, ultimately for the world. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to read out of Matthew chapter 9, verses uh, 35 through 38. If you'll stand with me, we're going to worship together by reading the word of God together out loud. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And Jesus went through all, all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers in his harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to see and appreciate the compassion that you have for us as your sheep. We pray that you would give us that same compassion for those sheep that are not here in this room. And God, we pray that you would help us by sending uh, individuals into the harvest, whether that be serving in this church, serving out of the church, reaching our neighbors, our coworkers, our relatives. God, would you move in a powerful way on your mission through your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Awesome. Kids, uh, I'm going to talk to your parents. You're welcome to listen. I'm talking to you as well. I will try to talk to you as well, but there's going to be a moment at the end of service where I'm going to invite the kids up and I will talk to you specifically. And then if your parents will allow it, there will be ice cream at the end. So please try to pay attention and I'm going to try and go as quickly as is conducive to what we're talking about. Okay. So Jesus is on mission. It says in verse 35, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues. That word synagogues, that was the place of, of uh, assembly for the Jewish people and proclaiming, teaching the gospel of the kingdom, saying that God's kingdom was being established here and now. And he went about healing every disease and every affliction. This is a bit of a summary statement. statement. If you read through Matthew, you see that you have these kind of two sections where Jesus, uh, where Matthew gives a summary statement, and then you see Jesus at work, doing miracles, preaching, teaching. And this is a, a, another summary statement of what Jesus has been doing, his ministry. He's been doing two things. It's had two components, really. First of all, there's the teaching and proclamation of the kingdom of God. Jesus came to teach and proclaim something about this kingdom of which we're going to hear a little bit about, but, but the Jewish people, they had been waiting for God's kingdom to be reestablished. They understood the language of kingdom. They understood that God had promised that he would provide a savior who would bring about salvation by establishing a kingdom. They were waiting for that. The second component is that he came healing every disease and every affliction, and I would add uh, overcoming demonic forces. I think that might be even included in that language of healing, uh, disease, and affliction. We see even if you just back up a few verses that Jesus, uh, in my Bible, it has these sections. It says, a, a girl is restored to life and a woman is healed. Then it goes on and it says, Jesus heals two blind men. Then it says, Jesus heals a man who's unable to speak. And the way he heals him is that he, he forces out a demonic force. So there's healing absolutely in kind of the, the web MD sort of, I'm going to take your body and put it from bad to better or bad to good. But there's also this sense of you're being oppressed because of the, the spirit of this world has, has infested it and that he is, he's able to oppress us. And that can sound a little weird if you've never been to church and talked about ooky spooky stuff, you can think, are we, are, you know, is this a, are we getting into a horror story? No, but the truth is that there is an enemy that we have, and he has people that follow him, or not people, uh, he has forces that follow him, and that Jesus came to confront those forces. He came to teach and proclaim the kingdom, and he came to heal every disease and every affliction. And that healing was intended to uh, present itself as identification that Jesus was the one. He was on a mission to establish his kingdom. Now, this wasn't a kingdom of the world, but it was a kingdom of God. And this is part of what was so confusing to the Jewish people, because they were waiting for Jesus to establish a kingdom on earth. Their, their, their quintessential example was King David, who had, an extent, who had established what? A kingdom on earth. They, their whole Old Testament 
their whole Bible for them was a, a story of God establishing a people on earth. But what they didn't understand was that that was preparatory for God who was going to establish a kingdom that superseded national, earthly, geographic kingdoms, that superseded ethnic divisions, that superseded national divisions. It was going to be a heavenly kingdom, a kingdom of people who would follow him. Jesus was on a mission to establish his kingdom by bringing about redemption. Most kings, when they establish a kingdom, they do so by force. They do so by, by coercion. They do so by political uh, intrigue. But Jesus was coming to do it in a very different way. He came to, est uh, to, to establish his kingdom by bringing about redemption. Um, in, in Luke chapter 4, you don't have to go there. You can if you want. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. Um, Jesus is he's about to begin his ministry, and he goes... Uh, to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up. Sometimes when people, visitors would come, they would, they would speak in the synagogue. Uh, they would preach or maybe teach something. And he comes into the synagogue, and, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to, him, given to him. They didn't have these, you know, bound books. They had scrolls. And so someone gave him the scroll of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the spirit, is, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And he began to say things to them, saying, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. See, Jesus came not just to establish some sort of kingdom where he was just going to wave a stick and rule. He came to establish a kingdom by means of redeeming people, taking people from darkness into light. That, that language of re redemption comes from Exodus where, Jesus, where God uh, takes the Israelites from slavery and he, almost, he pays for their salvation almost and redeems them and frees them. He, he came to proclaim good news. He sent the proclamation of liberty to the captives, recovering of, the, of sight to the blind, healing, to, set it, sorry, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. We talked about that, right? Proclamation, healing, freedom from oppression. Jesus showed signs of this redemption through his power to heal and free people. Um, as I said, the three narratives preceding the, the verse in, in Matthew talk about this aspect of his mission. Jesus was on mission, but as we'll see, he intended for others to follow him on mission. In verse 36, Jesus looks at the crowd and says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, when it says that we, when he, he saw the crowds, it, it can be read as like a specific instance, a particular instance, but it's also possible that he's just saying, in general, when he saw the crowds, as he came across the crowds, he was moved with compassion. He had compassion for the crowds. That word compassion, it's not just, I have nice, warm feelings. It actually is, is a word that, that kind of connects with gut. It's, it's like he had a gut-wrenching sense of sadness for the people. He saw their need. He saw what was going on in their lives, and he was, he was moved. His heart was moved. His stomach, it, it, it had knots in it. He was moved with compassion because of the state of the people. In my Bible, it says that the crowds were harassed and helpless. Other, other versions will say things like he, he was uh, afflicted or um, cast down. The first word, harassed, some commentaries point out that the language here is of a sheep that's been torn, maybe by thistles or, or torn by, by an attack by a wolf, but there's a sense in which it's been wounded. He saw the people and saw that they had been wounded, perhaps by their own sin, perhaps by the, the sins of others, perhaps by the enemy. Have you ever felt wounded and thought that, that categor, categorized, that identified who you were in the moment? I am wounded. I'm torn up. They were harassed. They were also helpless. And, and like the, the picture of being harassed, the picture of being helpless was one of being thrown down. Imagine a sheep who's been attacked, who can't get up, 
It's, it's thrown down. You know, sheep are uniquely in need of a shepherd. They're, they're not very good at doing a lot of things, even without danger. They, they, they struggle. They were cast down. They were vulnerable, weak, defenseless, without anyone to care for them or protect them. That's, that's how Jesus sees his people. And it's, it's interesting for me as I'm thinking about this, because when I look at people who don't follow him, when I look at maybe a neighbor or, or someone at the grocery store, what I don't necessarily always jump to is, oh, that person is in need of my compassion. And sometimes I'm, th- I, I, I'm tempted to think to myself, oh, man, I'm kind of jealous of that person. But because of Jesus' ability to see into who they actually are, to see their brokenness, to see the fact that they are without hope, without him, he had compassion. This language of compassion is, uh, and, and the sheep needing a shepherd is something that, that I think that he draws from the Old Testament. If, if we were to go to Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Numbers chapter 27, verse 17, we see that Moses, he's, he, they're about to enter into the, the promised land, but Moses is not going to be able to go, and so he's praying and asking God to provide a, a, another leader in his stead. And, and it says this, uh, Moses spoke, starting in verse 15, Moses spoke to the Lord saying, let the Lord God of the spirits of all flesh appoint a man over the congregation. God, give us another leader who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in that the congregation of the Lord may not be as a sheep that has no shepherd. The people of God have always needed a shepherd. There's another text in, in Zechariah chapter 10 where it talks about that because of the, the idolatry of the Israelites, they were like sheep without a shepherd. We live in a, life, in, in a, in a season, in a culture, in a world, in a time of idolatry where we, we see people around us who are sheep without a shepherd. Sheep, and, and if maybe you can't connect with the woundedness of it, you can connect with the wanderingness of it. Our culture, you look around, you're like, Why? Why are you doing those things? And I know that there are people my generation and older who are looking and they can't even, I don't even know how you got to where you are right now. And it's because wandering and wandering and wandering. Sheep without a shepherd. And what's interesting is that unlike religious pundits, unlike pharisaical people, unlike me at times, Jesus has what compassion on them. He knows their situation probably better than they do. He, he knows their greatest need. Their greatest need isn't more money, a better job. It isn't, it isn't relational fixing, although that's important. It isn't uh, fixing this and that earthly oppression as much as it's, it's recognizing that they need redemption from their own sinfulness. He knows their deceptions. He knows their bondage to sin. Christian, how... How do you feel and what do you feel when you look at the crowds? I, I was wrestling with this question because I, I don't think that I respond the way Jesus does nearly as much as he would expect me to. And this is something I was praying, you know, God help me to have compassion. When you see your neighbors, when you see your coworkers, when you see those relatives, perhaps your heart isn't moved in the same way that Jesus is. is and if so, I would encourage you to consider how Jesus was moved when he saw you. Each of us was part of the crowd at one point. Some of us can remember very specifically how we went from being part of the crowd to in his discipleship. For others of us, it was like a slow process where God almost did this and then we realized, what happened here? I believe in Jesus now. But we were all at one point, part of the crowd, and God looked at us with compassion. He looked at me with compassion. He was moved by your pain and your plight. When we remember that we have been shepherds without, or been sheep without a shepherd, it will cause compassion to grow. Once Jesus, his compassion rises, he acts. We see in this text that he acts, but he doesn't act how I would expect him to act. It says in verses 37 and 8, Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest 
to send out laborers into the harvest. Jesus was on mission, and as he proclaimed the kingdom of heaven, he, he was acting, he was healing, he was freeing, he was delivering, he was preaching. Yet here, it says that when he had, had compassion, he didn't do any of those things specifically. He didn't preach, he didn't heal, he didn't cast out in that moment. He looked at the people who were following him, and he told them to pray. He commands his disciples to pray, and I was thinking to myself, why? Why? I mean, Jesus is kind of a big deal. If you know anything about Jesus, he is fully man, which means that he can identify with, with us. But at the same time, he's also fully God, which mean he's, means he's, he's all-powerful, omniscient, omnipotent, able to do whatever he wants to do that conforms to his nature and character. Why does he ask them to pray? Why doesn't he just tell them to start doing work? And in fact, later on, just a few verses later, if you, if you skip ahead, he then tells them to go do things. So why doesn't he just say, guys, the, labor, uh, the laborers are few, the harvest is plentiful, go do some work. Why does he say to pray? I've got three reasons that I think he does this. First of all, they, they needed to know that they could not accomplish this alone. Because when we pray, what we're doing is we're saying, God, there's something that I need that I can't provide. There's something that I need that I see that is a need in the world that I can't provide. Because if I could provide it, there'd be no need for prayer. There'd be no need to come to our Heavenly Father and ask. The second reason is that, that I think that he does this is that so they would know that it's the Lord that sends. There's a big difference between someone who is a self-identified uh, leader and someone who has been sent. And, and we know because we've all been on the internet and you've seen people who have been self-identified, I'm a leader, I'm a thought leader, I'm, a, I'm an influencer. And you're like, but why? And it's, we live in a weird time where credentials are not credentials and I mean, you can kind of say stuff on the internet and if, if enough people believe it, it sticks. But we need to understand that when it comes to the kingdom of God, God sends his people. Because ultimately, number three, they needed to know that this was the Lord's harvest. The Lord was responsible for the fruit. And this is, I'm so thankful for this because if anyone knows me, you know that I have limitations. That's a nice way of putting it. Like I, I there are some things. I'm not the most organized person in the world. I, I do some things really well and other things I do rather rather poorly. And that's just being a human person. And so I, it brings me great relief to know that the salvation of, of people is not ultimately on me, though I do have a part to play in that. I have a responsibility to preach the gospel, to, to be faithful to this word, to say things that God says with the hope that he will move on your hearts so that you might come under his authority. Not my authority, his authority. At the same time, I don't have to go home and thinking to myself, well, I did a really bad job praying or preaching or whatever, and because of that, X, Y, and Z might happen. No, I want to be serious and faithful, absolutely, because God calls me to be faithful, but it's his harvest. When God sees, I'm sorry, when we see that, that God's got a mission, we don't have to just offer our services, we engage our faith in the God who is doing the heavy lifting. So, for example, if you're interested in doing children's ministry, but you're like, I don't know what to do. All I know is, like, I, like, I, I can make kids laugh, but I don't know if I could preach that gospel. If you, if you love kids and you can read, you can share the good news. You don't even really have to read. We've got videos. You can talk to people. You don't have to be afraid because ultimately God's at work and you just become a conduit of his power. You become a conduit of his grace. You just have to be open. Amen. You know, you know what a bad pipe is? A bad pipe is one that, that is blocked. But if you just kind of get out of the way, pipes don't have to do a lot. They just kind of have to exist. There's, there, there's not a lot of com complexity to the design. You just have to make way for the water to flow. That's, that's what it is to serve God. The disciples needed to know that the mission required a lot of workers. They needed to know that when someone joins the mission, it ought to be because God has sent them. They need to know that even 
when things seem fruitless, their responsibility is to preach and to pray and to trust God with, for heart change. And today, you and I, can, we can pray the same things, that God would provide workers for the harvest. This is something I've been praying. We're planting a church. Today, they're meeting. It's wonderful. Amen. Also, yeah, give it up. Tenley Town. Also, I'm praying God establish people here at Grace Covenant Church Sterling, people who have not been serving who need to serve. God, establish people not just who need to serve because, man, I need people to serve, but, but people who need to experience the grace of God flow through their life into the life of others. I, I, I want you to hear this, that when, when you join a mission with God, you're not just, you're not just a, a, an inert hammer. When God picks up your life and, and, and endues it with power, fills it with power, you get the privilege of experiencing the grace of God that you would experience you would not experience otherwise. I can say that as a person who's, who's worked in, in, in industry, in, in uh, the commercial world. It's great. It's wonderful. But there's something unique that God does when we join in and serve him. And I'm not saying you all need to become vocational ministers, but I am saying that all of us should ask God, how should be, I be a part of this process of, of providing workers for the harvest? We can trust God to do the work by providing workers. We can trust God when he sends us, and he, we can trust God when things get hard. And we'll see uh, that if we seek the kind of compassion that Jesus has and pray this way, we'll find that, that we almost naturally become those who join God's mission. Now, I didn't include this part, but if you were to go, and I invite you to do it, read chapter 10. Um, you could read the first 14 verses. It basically says Jesus came, he, he was doing all this ministry in verses uh, 35 through 38 of chapter 9. Uh, and when he saw the crowd, he told them, you guys need to pray. You guys need to pray for laborers. And then he came and he, he selects his disciples and then he gives them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Interesting. It says in, in verse 35 that Jesus was what? Teaching, proclaiming the gospel, and healing every disease and every affliction. And what does he say in chapter 10? But he told them, now it's your turn to go heal every disease and every affliction. He, he sends them into towns. He tells them to preach the gospel. He says, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, guys, this is my mission, but now I'm giving that mission to you. This is what I was doing, but I don't just want you to watch me do it. I want you to do it as well. He had compassion on the crowd. He told them to pray, but then he sent them out. And then in Matthew 28, he gives his final mission statement. We've, we've heard it before, but it's worth hearing again. He says, Jesus, after he's raised from the dead, he's speaking to his disciples, he's sending them out. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And he, he's almost saying, and now I'm authorizing you to do this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Make people who will follow me by following you as you follow me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. God has got a mission, and he's, got, he, he's, he's going to provide for this church. He's going to provide for Tendley Town. He's going to provide for all the churches in the U.S. He's going to provide for the world. And he invites us to participate by praying and figuring out how we might ourselves go. But I want you to, as, as I come to a close and as we're about to do things with the kids, so kids wake up or pay attention or whatever it is, I want you to never forget that Jesus was moved for you. You know, as I was preparing this message, I was thinking about that myself. You know, how, how, how have I experienced the compassion of God? And I thought back to those individuals who looked at me with Jesus' eyes and saw someone who needed a shepherd. I remember uh, one of my best friends from growing up, we played laser tag in the neighborhood, soccer, rollerblades, and his mom, Connie, Connie Schinkelberg, uh, she loved me like her own son, which also means that she corrected me quite a lot. She was an English teacher. Um, she let me come over pretty much whenever I wanted, which... Now being a parent and an adult, pretty impressive. I just walk in. I, I don't, I, I, 
you have to live a very specific kind of life to be living in such a way that a teenage boy can just walk in whenever and it's, it's okay. And she would let me eat their stuffed crust pizza when they had pizza night. Uh, she would let me go to the freezer and get their Schwann's uh, ice cream sandwiches. You know, the Schwann's guy who, would, I don't know if that's still a thing. I've seen the truck around, but for whatever reason, they had like delivery ice cream cones before DoorDash. It was glorious, or ice cream sandwiches. She let me eat them. I remember uh, Jeff, my youth pastor, who, who let me lead the high school worship team, even though I was, I was immature and overzealous. I remember, you know, playing guitar and singing and looking at these, you know, teenagers, being teenagers, being totally just teenagers, maybe shy, maybe un- uncomfortable with singing. And I stopped the song and looked at them and I'm like, guys, don't you, don't you hear these lyrics? Why aren't you worshiping? So I was, I was chastising them. And Jeff gave me, gave me a chance, even though that was a terrible thing for me to have done. Um, I remember in college, Ron and Stephen, my pastors in college, who tried to teach me to be intentional, to live by the Spirit, to be a man of God. I could, I could go on. There have been men and women who have poured into my life. Jesus has had co- compassion on me, uh, abundant compassion on me for someone who, who doesn't deserve it. Someone prayed these men and women into my life. Someone prayed, God, provide labors for the harvest in, in Wake Forest, North Carolina. Someone prayed, God, please help send some people, God, in Dale City, Virginia, in the 90s. And someone is praying now and, and, and sending some of you into ministry, sending some of you, not just into capital M ministry, I'm going to be a vocational pastor, but into how can I Take what I have and offer it to God by offering it to others. Who has shown you Christ's compassion? And for whom can you have compassion today? How will you follow Jesus in ministry? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to see with the eyes of Christ, to have compassion on those who need your compassion. Lord, to pray with faith that you would send workers in the harvest and ultimately, Lord, to to offer our lives as living sacrifices. So if you call us to be sent, whether it's to to be an usher, to work in the parking lot, or to be on the worship team, or to preach or teach, or to just share our faith with our neighbors, God, that we would be willing and able. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kiddos, come on up. Come sit right over here. Parents, if you're not comfortable, you can come as well. Again, let's right here. I know everyone wants to get on stage, but we're going to go right here. I'm going to sit down. All right. Some of you are new. It's good to see you. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. I'm going to sit down too. Hi. You did so good not coming on stage. Great job. High five. You were just hanging out up front. All right, guys. So I hope you were listening. It's okay if you weren't. I'm so glad to see you guys. How are you doing? Good. Are you enjoying this hot weather or do you not like this hot weather? Raise your hand if you're enjoying the hot weather. Raise your hand if you don't enjoy the hot weather. Raise your hand if you're not sure how to answer. Okay, that's fair. Um, well, I'm glad you're enjoying the hot weather. I am not, but we're going to move on. Um, so I taught today about this guy named Jesus. Do you guys know who Jesus is? Yes. Yeah, he's, he's the son of God, and God sent him, God the Father sent him, and you know what he has for people? He has this feeling called compassion. Do you know what compassion is? Yeah. No. What's compassion? Where you care for others. Good job. That's good. Compassion is where you care for for others, have you, ever got, have you ever looked at someone, maybe they, they fell and skinned their knee, and you were like, oh, and it made you feel upset and hurt, and you felt bad for them? Yeah. Yes? Have you ever skinned your own knee and felt bad and hurt for yourself? Sometimes, when we do that, we feel compassion. We feel uh, care for other people. And did you know that Jesus feels compassion for you? Yes. Everybody, look at me. Ready? One, two, three. And I want you to say with me, Jesus Jesus has has compassion for me. me. That means that he cares for you. 
And when he feels sad for people, he, he invites us to do things. Jesus wants us to do two things, okay? Thing number one, he invites us to pray. Do you guys know what praying is? What's praying? Talking to God, right. He invites us to talk to God. So if, if, if we have compassion, if we see someone at school who needs help, you know what we can do? We can say, God, will you please send someone to help that person? You know what else he does? What's the second thing he does? He invites us to help. That means that sometimes when we pray, we look and we see, hey, you know what? Good save. All right. I know. You want to, everyone wants to speak. It's okay. Um, he invites us not just to pray, but to participate. That means he wants us to help. So sometimes, we're almost done, guys. Sometimes when we see that someone needs help, when we have feelings where we care for someone, we can show our care by helping them. Does everyone know how to help? Yes. You, you, you all have been big helpers, right? And I'm going to pray that God would make you big help. Yeah, there we go. I like that enthusiasm. I'm going to pray that God would help you to know him. And there we go. There's some compassion. I get it. All right. We're going to pray that God would help you to know him. And we're going to pray that God would help you to serve him by helping others. All right, ready? Everybody put your hands together like that. Heads down, eyes closed real quick. And I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these kids. I pray that you would help them to have care for other people. Lord, and I pray that you would send them to serve and help however you have intended them to do. Bless these children, I pray. pray. Jesus, I pray that they would know you, that they would serve you all their life, they would love you, and that you would bless them. Jesus, I thank you that you love these children, that you have compassion for them. Amen. Amen. Great job. All right, y'all go sit down. Thank you so much. Parents, I, I know that this is a mixed bag, that it's fun and exciting, and I'm so thankful, and I know that it's also challenging at times, and, and I want to personally thank you for making moments like this possible, because it's important for our kids to know that they're people to whom God speaks. So your efforts to keep them quiet, your efforts to keep them corralled, it's, it's you're serving God by loving your children well. So thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, Jesus has compassion on you. And if you're in this room and you've never trusted Jesus as your own Lord and Savior, if you're not sure what that means, I would invite you to, to come. There are going to be people who who pray with you. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray in just a moment. Um, but But Jesus invites us to trust him. The good news is that he died on the cross for our sins. He, he rose again, defeating Satan's sin and death. And now he offers life and redemption and his compassion to anyone who trusts in him. We're going to pray right now. And it, if that's you, if, if you want to trust Jesus as your own Lord and Savior today, would you raise your hand while heads are bowed and eyes are closed? Great. I see that hand. You can put it back down. Awesome. You're going to pray with me. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know that I, I've disobeyed you and broken your rules, that I, because of that, I'm a sinner, and that there's a punishment that I deserve. But I thank you, Jesus, that you took my punishment and that you give eternal life to people who trust and follow you. And I want to trust and follow you with my life. Lord, help me to walk out, to live a life that trusts and follows you. In Jesus' name, amen.